So we're going to do metaphysics now. And, and this is a big part of modern philosophy that then by the time of Marx had already kind of had its heyday and then we're kind of in a, into a new phase with Marx. And then of course with Enrique Dussel uh, in the 21st century now, uh, he's trying to, you know, really rethink philosophy and where do we go from here, uh, breaking away from this whole tradition of modernity. Okay, so um, let me just check here. All right, so uh, The Metaphysics is another book um, that you know, obviously is related to physics, but it's sort of meta, uh, you know, in Greek really means kind of on the side, like walking side by side, going together. It goes together with uh, physics. Um, but some people, you know, because of the way it developed subsequently um, after Aristotle, uh, we often think of metaphysics as being above and beyond uh, physics. So physics is more mundane and metaphysics takes us to some kind of higher level. And, uh, and so that prefix meta gets, you know, displaced from its original meaning. Um, and I should mention too that Aristotle, he, he wasn't writing books. Uh, most of the writings that we have from him uh, some are, are more organized, uh, like the Nicomachean Ethics seems to be like he intended it as a, a standalone work, but a lot of what we have from Aristotle is just notes, like lecture, they appear to be lecture notes. They're very sketchy and, and just, you know, um, almost an outline form. And so, uh, and, and he didn't collect them into the books that we have. So, later people within the Lyceum, within his peripatetic school. Um, and, and the reason why Aristotelians are called peripatetic, so you might see this in some, of, if you look through these links, you'll see peripatetic. Uh, it, that means to walk around. And that's the way that in the Lyceum of Aristotle, that's the way he liked to teach. He liked to teach in the courtyard uh, of the building that he had and sort of walk around and the students would follow him and he would discuss things. And, uh, and, and, and so that's his peripatetic style, walking around, okay. Um, but then that just becomes a name for Aristotelianism. Uh, metaphysics, okay, so even Aristotle himself refers to metaphysics as wisdom. And the, you know, that has some connection to Plato, uh, a big connection to Plato. And uh, if you, if you uh, take like an intro to philosophy course, you'll see that this concept of wisdom is very pl platonic. Uh, usually, you know, the professors will, will cover uh, this notion of wisdom. Um, but then there's some unique ways that he talks about metaphysics in terms of first philosophy. And so we want to remember that term first philosophy. That's, that's interesting. And then sometimes he just called it theology. And of course he was a Greek who uh, worshiped a pantheon of gods. Uh, and so theology for Aristotle is not theology as we know it. Uh, Today, it's uh, very pantheistic and, and a Greek, you know, sort of theology. Okay, um, but that kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, what's going on here? Now, one, one thing that in the metaphysics gets added on to this whole picture of physics, as we've already gone through, is entelechy. And entelechy is, uh, the formal perfection of the nature of a thing, you know, the formal perfection of the physics, you know, like all this, all these dynamics. And we have those, you know, the, we think of uh, 
thermodynamics, uh, physics, you know, the way that Aristotle is thinking about it, you know, he's thinking about it in terms of dynamics and we have some individual substance and it has certain physics, it has certain dynamics, it has a nature and it can do certain things. It doesn't always do everything it can do. Uh, it does, you know, some things are realized and some things are unrealized. And then on top of that, he wants to add this notion of entelechy. And that means that the nature of a thing can maybe have a perfection to which it is headed. And, um, you know, so a, a very common example is like an acorn. An acorn is not a tree. But an acorn has within it somehow the entelechy of growing into a tree. There's some kind of programming, the way we would think about it. There's some kind of programming in the, in the acorn. We think of like genetic programming, okay, uh, and that's some kind of explanation. But Aristotle using different terminology. I mean, what does genetic programming really mean to a normal person like you and I are, um, you know, we, we don't know, know genetics. Uh, you know, we have only a vague understanding of that. So that's not much more of an explanation for us than what Aristotle is talking about is, you know, entelechy, some kind of, there's something in the acorn that makes it naturally, by its nature, by its physics, grow into a giant tree. Very amazing. Um, but this is sort of a characteristic feature of things that are alive. Okay, so it, this this aspect is really prominent in things that are living. A granule of sugar, a little crystal of sugar, does that have an entelechy? Well, maybe it does. I mean, maybe there is something towards it which it is perfecting itself um, by its nature, but it's probably pretty close there because it's not really going to do much. Um, there's not many modifications that it's going to go undergo or, or, or develop out of itself that is going to make it somehow perfected into what it always was meant to be. It is what it's meant. It is what it is, right? Um, so things like rocks, they, they might have some kind of entelechy in them, depending on your interpretation of Aristotle or your elaboration of, of what he's saying, but primarily we're thinking of living things like human beings. Okay, there's an entelechy of a human being uh, starts out as, you know, a zygote in the mother's womb and then develops and then is born and then is taken care of by the mother for a long period of time and then grows up and is educated and eventually uh, there's some sort of perfection of the human that it's that it's that it's working towards and eventually uh, you know naturally becomes uh, if given the right circumstances and for Aristotle that's the explanation of the psyche which we often translate as mind or soul. And in Greek way of thinking and Aristotle's thinking, there's not a, a big distinction between the mind and the soul. And so it's the, the psyche that's, that's the cause, uh, sort of final causation of the development of the human person. Okay. And maybe that ends at some point earlier in life, maybe it ends at death, uh, or maybe it ends beyond death. Maybe after death, there, there's some perfection that we're not entirely aware of. Um, you know, that, that, that question is, is left open. 
So you see that, you know, he is sort of getting into theology just by introducing these ideas that then can just kind of be expanded upon in lots of different ways. All right, and then another key concept is that uh, when we have a, an individual substance, like the gingerbread rectangle, it is not going to stay the same. It is going to change. That's part of existing, is change. Uh, things that exist change. And so um, everything is moved in this way of thinking. Everything is caused to change qualities, to change shape, color, or whatever the case may be, uh, or smell, you know, so we don't have to be purely focused on visual representation, but I, but there is a reason why this visual model is so prevalent in my thinking, because I'm thinking of later stuff we're going to get to. Um, but that gingerbread is going to change. It's going to get super hard and so it's like it's not going to be enjoyable to eat at some point it's going to get stale and um, and, and all these sorts of things and that's just the nature of the cookie um, so it's going to be moved naturally by its physics by its nature uh, but aristotle argues that there must be some originary cause of all motion, right? The, the, we know that there's this efficient causation from like, you know, uh, if we think of the gingerbread cookie, you know, we're thinking of like air particles are, are impacting the surface and, and the moisture is being evaporated up out of it. You know, this is all the kind of process that Aristotle is thinking of. And he's like, all that motion that's involved in the decaying of the gingerbread square, there has to be a cause of all that. And uh, he argues that that cause must, must itself ultimately the the originary and he's not thinking necessarily in terms of time but fundamentally there's something that is causing this in all four ways material final uh, formal and efficient all that causation all those types of causation have to have some cause and uh, you know, there has to be something to explain the existence of causation itself. And so this is what he calls the unmoved mover, uh, which later the Aristotelians called the prime mover. Um, and so, uh, and, and then Aristotle thinks of this on the model of like I was saying about the human being, the human being has an entelechy that makes the human develop into its perfection. Not that they're going to be totally perfect, but there is just like an acorn grows into a tree and that's its perfection. It's like the development, its natural development. The human being has an entelechy which brings out its natural development. The universe with all the causation, all the dynamics that are going on in it has an entelechy that is causing it to reach and develop naturally into some sort of perfection. Okay. Uh, and this cause is not moved. This cause is perfectly at rest, perfectly indivisible. It has no parts, uh, perfectly rational. Uh, and perfectly contemplating itself. That's what it does, is it just contemplates itself. But the entelechy is not the physical world, the physical universe. The entelechy is like the soul of the world. Okay, 
So the unmoved mover is like the world soul. Uh, and, and now we're definitely getting into like theology. And, um, and there's something that's kind of interesting about what he's saying here, but it's, it's not very satisfactory because it, it assumes like the universe is progressing towards some sort of perfection. Okay. Um, but now the word perfection, you know, maybe doesn't quite apply because, I mean, what if the universe is heading towards one giant black hole? Okay, great. That's a kind of perfection, but not, not something that you would think of as perfection from a human perspective. That doesn't sound like too much fun. Um, <clears throat> All right, so, but, uh, but again, uh, Aristotle has gone from very common sense sort of explanations about, you know, gingerbread houses and all that monkey business, but now he's starting to, to get out there. He's building upon these ideas. And so he kind of sets these, these more uh, spiritual sort of ideas apart in the metaphysics. Okay. Uh, it makes sense. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll leave that there, and then I'll come back and uh, do a recording for Arabic philosophy and, and rational theology. So we'll just take this like one chunk at a time. Okay. <clears throat>